Hello, everyone. My name is Essen, and I'm the Surgical Neuro-Oncology Fellow at Dal Khan University Hospital and member of Pakistan Society of Neuro-Oncology, PASNO. On behalf of PASNO, I welcome you all to this session. PASNO is organizing the Neuro-Oncology webinar series, and each session in this webinar series will be an hour long and held on alternate Saturdays. During the talk of our guest speaker, all attendees will be muted to enable the speaker present without any interruption. Questions can be submitted in the chat box and will be answered once the presenter has finished their talk. Attendees can also raise their hands for questions. We will unmute them to speak. This session will be recorded and the link will be shared on the PASNO website. The speaker will take 30 minutes for topic presentation and after that there will be an open discussion between our esteemed speaker, panelists and the attendees. The topic of today's session is management of complex glomerular tumors, and today's speaker is Dr. Mian, uh, Diego Mendes Rosito. Dr. Diego Mendes Rosito is the director of skull base course and head of the hypothesis clinic at the National Medical Center of the Institute for Social Security and Services for State Workers in Mexico City. He completed his residency at the National Institute of Neurology and Neurosurgery in Mexico. He is the president of the skull base chapter in the Latin American Federation of Neurosurgery Societies. Thank you so much, Dr. Mendes, for joining us today, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Ather, for the invitation. Thank you very much, Hassan, also for the kind invitation and 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 uh, management of the of the of the meeting. Uh, thank you all for for being here on this Saturday. Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about uh, complex uh, glomerular tumor. I'm gonna share my screen. Just a second here. Okay. There, you can see my screen, right? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, the management of glomerular tumors, it's a, I would say it's a specific entity of, of the skull base, which requires a combination of, of different things. It requires a, a thorough knowledge of the anatomy, uh, combining it with uh, refined microsurgical techniques, and also very important, I would say, with a good strategy and knowledge of the of the pathology in the skull base. So I think it's a very interesting pathology because it requires uh, different uh, things that make you um, evolve as a neurosurgeon, as a skull base surgeon, and so it requires a combination of these of these things. Um, I'm going to start talking about with a specific case, uh, how this case changed in a way our, our practice. This is a case of a, of a 58 year old male. Uh, the thing with this, uh, with this patient is that, is that he had two months that, that he was uh, fully in bed without any ability to, to stand up or to do any, he was completely dependent of, of care. And so he was completely in bed for, for two months prior to the surgery. He was referred to us with this enormous lesion. This lesion, as you can see, it's a, it's a gigantic tumor that it's involving and it's compressing the brainstem and the cerebellum. And it's eroding and it's, and it's uh, eroding all the way from the foramen jugular, invading also the cavernous, the posterior part of the cavernous sinus, as we can see here. And it has a gigantic compression of the of, of the of the posterior fossa. So in this case, it combined several of the things that we were mentioning, and we had to do a good strategy for this patient. As part of the strategy, we did a, a, an external carotid uh, angio, and here you can see all the 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 supply, the arterial supply come from, coming from the external carotid from several branches of the external carotid and how this tumor was completely uh, vascularized. In this moment, of the only thing I could think, it was like, I was feeling like 
like David against Goliath, you know? So it was like, for me, it was, I felt like David in a way because very small with a, such a gigantic tumor. And so this, in a way, I would say, uh, correlating with, with, with ancient uh, literature, this is the, the way I was feeling in a way. It was this, uh, just watching the tumor carefully in a way to try to, to understand it, to analyze it, and to see how uh, the, the, I could see the, the tumor and how I could win uh, the battle against the tumor. So checking the, the angiogram, uh, we could see that this uh, tumor also had uh, circulation from, from the internal carotid, from the meningopophyseal trunk, as you can see here, from all, it was the, the part that it was uh, nourishing the part in the, in the cavernous sinus. And also you could see from the contralateral ICA, there were some small branches that were giving uh, as well as in the vertebral basilar system. So this is a gigantic tumor where it's uh, vascularized and it's giving uh, arterial supply from all the different branches that we can see from anterior and posterior circulation. So as part of the strategy here, uh, we do a, a CT reconstruction in order to understand and to see how this tumor is highly vascularized and how uh, we can see it from different perspectives and different angles in order to understand the pathology, you know? So it's important that, uh, that we try to simulate what we are expecting to see in the tumor, in the, in the, in the surgery, and how we can find the tumor. But it's very important to understand completely the vascularization of the tumor. Now here, this arrows uh, mention the high importance of the vascularity and the compression of the system. So in this, in this specific case, we had to, to try to, um, to delimitate the most important parts of the tumor where we wanted to decompress, for example, in this area that we are highlighting here. And so it's very important because we wanted to avoid the brainstem compression. What we do is this type of incision, the curvilinear, all the way to the, to the cervical region. It's very important to have a, 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 a definitive uh, incision where we dissect the sternocleated muscle. Very important to keep uh, alive the, the, the nerve, the greater auricular nerve, in order to use it for reconstruction when it's needed. And so we dissect completely the, the, the sternocleid muscle and we reflect part of the, of, the, of the temporalis muscle. Now, when we do the, the disinsertion of the, of the muscle, we can see that we can find the, the neurovascular structures, as we can see here. We have there the internal carotid artery referred and the external carotid. There we can see that we have uh, already li ligated the, 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 the different branches the, from the thyroid, superior thyroid, the facial, the pharyngeal as the ascendant and the occipital, the occipital branch. At this moment, what we are, uh, after we have a vascular proximal control of the tumor, we do a mastoidectomy, that, which is tailored according to each case. What we do is we always preserve that uh, cortical, cortical part of the, of, the, of the mastoid. And we start with the drilling. And at this point, we can see when we can identify the, the, uh, the initial part of the tumor. As you can see, we can see only a little bit of the tumor and, and it's a bleeding tumor, as it, even though it was uh, previously embolized by the interventional team. Then we complete the mastoidectomy and we can see that here we have the transverse process of C1. We have, we have uh, the vertebral artery. In this case, since it was so, we had so many compression of the, of the, of the brainstem, uh, uh, we started in the retrosigmoid space and we decided to ligate the, the sigmoid sinus, as you can see here, and section it in order, in order to, to, to have a, a wide region to decompress. 
Um, as you can see here, we are we can see that it's a gigantic tumor uh, into the posterior fossa, and we are carefully coagulating and per carefully uh, dissecting it from the brainstem at this moment. And so we can see that we have the the tumor here is par partially completed, partially with uh, with dura of the posterior fossa. But you can see that even that it's a very very uh, hard tumor, which uh, even with the knife, uh, and you can see it that once you get in, it's it's very very coagulated. And so we continue the devascularization and debulking of the tumor. In this case, we are doing it with big pieces. And, uh, but it's important to, to understand each tumor and to try to know it. Once you are in, you can start uh, doing some, some debulking and understanding how the vascularity of the tumor behaves. In, at this moment, we are opening the the this cutting the sigmoid sinus in order to have a complete exposure of the retro of the presigmoid and and the retro sig, sigmoid space at this moment we are doing the the a higher decompression of the of the tumor where we can see that we have the free edge of the tentorium we can see there the fourth cranial nerve which and the, the free edge of the tentorium is completely sectioned. And so this will allow us to completely understand and, and to decompress the tumor and have it in, in, build, in big bulges. And later on, what we do is that we uh, close the jugular vein, which is very important, and always open the jugular vein distally. And so when you open it, you can, when we, you open it, you can open and you can see the tumor inside the jugular vein and the jugular bulb. And that is going to be the origin of the tumor normally. And so you can continue the, the, the dissection from its origin all the way to the, to the region. Now we can see here, here, all the brain stem completely decompressed. As we can see here, we can see we saw the fourth, the fifth cranial nerve, which is completely uh, bulged to, due to the compression. We can see the seven and eight uh, complex. This is part of the reconstruction that we do with putting a little bit of everything, muscle, fascia lata, durogen, a fibrin glue, and also an external ventricular drainage. And this is the patient in the post-op. He, what I mentioned that he couldn't uh, stand up in, from his bed. And so he had a great improvement uh, in a way. And so we know here, we can see that we have a very large decompression of the posterior fossa. We still have some tumor in the cavernous sinus, which we decided, as we can see here, which we decided that we were going to complement it with uh, with radiation therapy in case it, it it grew back. But in a way, this is a very extensive decompression, as you can see here. The from the pre-op to the post-op, we have a, a large decompression of the posterior fossa, and the most important thing is that the, our patient had a, a a good clinical outcome, improving his symptoms, and so. In a way, I was I was feeling like, okay, like uh, the prisoners by Michelangelo, where we you have some, you are tailoring some of the of the of the things uh, to improve each case, but in a way there are some angles which you have to improve, and some things that you have to improve in 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 order to to help the following patients, and so this is the way I I visualized it, and so in order to have a, a masterpiece or in order to have a uh, the best case in, in a way, you have to work and to see the pathology from different angles in order to understand it, that, you, that the pathology has different angles where you have to understand completely the anatomy and, 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 uh, and try to improve just like in art, just like in sculpture, because for me, uh, neurosurgery and skull base, it's an art, it's a, it's a sculpturing the surgical act. You know? 
And so we analyzed our cases. Uh, to this time, we had 30 paragangliomas. It's a, a fair number, but we also have uh, complications. We like to focus not on the big numbers or, or, or so, but oh, to focus on the complications that we have. We had a good number of CSF leak, which was uh, uh, inside the, the incision, but there was always a uh, good problems with reconstruction. So I tried to analyze our cases and think, how can I improve for the following case? What can I do better? And so we have to study our, our basis or, or all the story from the, how uh, people learned from these cases and from this pathology. And so we have to understand also the anatomy, all the regional anatomy, uh, which Duarte Candido has, uh, I was mentioning a very nice lecture on the foramen jugular anatomy. And so it's very important understanding uh, how the relationships of the foramen jugular and the relationships, as we can see here with the jugular bulb to, with, the, with the anatomy. And so uh, also very important to understand the anatomy of the nutrition or, or the supply, arterial supply of the tumor. So that we can do it either from the anatomy and also with the, with the, with the preoperative studies such as the angiogram, which is very important to analyze carefully prior to the surgery. And so the, some other cases that we have, for example, look at this, it's a 19 year old female that she had all the cranial nerves that, that she could have uh, lesioned. So with a, such a big tumor that had, uh, that was invading uh, in a, such a young patient uh, that she was invading the, 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 the posterior fossa with a, such a terrible brainstem compression and all this extension to the, to the jugular bulb and the jugular vein. So it's very important to understand for example, in this case, it was some of the learnings because in this case, we did the same incision as we mentioned prior, priorly. And uh, as you can see here in this picture, this is the part that extended uh, all the way to the neck, as you can see the tip of the mastoid. And this is all the jugular vein, which is completely full of tumor. And so for, to have a, a, a nice, uh, to have a good vascular proximal control of the arterial supply, We'll, we were trying to reach and to see the, the external jugular, uh, to the, the external carotid artery, and we couldn't find it because it was so, so, so big. And uh, we wanted to see the branches, the pharyngeal, the ascending pharyngeal. And we, for us, it was much easier to, to close completely all the external uh, carotid uh, artery. And, uh, and that was a mistake that we had to learn the bad way because we had the incision and the incision started to, uh, to suffer and to be necrotic. And it was a terrible thing because we, she, got, uh, she was uh, getting worse and worse and worse within days. And look at this, it's terrible. So it was a terrible learning that in a way uh, that we had to, to select uh, uh, properly uh, which arterial supply is getting better. We cannot, this, these tumors are like stealing, like AVMs that steal uh, supply, arterial supply to the, to, the, to the skin. So we have to understand carefully the arterial supply in order to select a properly which uh, uh, arterial uh, feeders we have to, to take out. And this is another case. This is a case of a 31-year-old male. And uh, this is a case I did uh, overseas. And so in a way it was like, oh yes, the endovascular, they can start and do the angio and they can embolize it. And uh, it was a, a fine tumor. You can see that there was some coming from the vertebral artery, some feeders here, which were okay. Uh, but the thing is that when they did the, 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 embolize, the embolization, the patient had a new neurological deficit after the embolization. And so it's very important that you have to uh, double check the patient, even though if you checked him prior, uh, prior to, the, to the procedure, but you always have to check 
on the on the on the clinical status because this patient he got worse with the embolization and, and we were like uh, we had to fly to this place and so uh, when we got there we could see the CT uh, the CT it had some he they embolized with onyx which uh, I don't like it very much because it like feeds everywhere uh, not for these cases. And the thing here is that it had onyx uh, 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 and disturbing that the you can see well, but around the complete tumor. And so, okay, we talked with the patient, we talked with the family, and then we did the same incision as we mentioned per, uh, previously. But what we found is that if this was the tumor, you could see that there were embolized uh, venous. Uh, look at this. You can see branches from the from the superior petrosal sinus where were that were embolized, and so this was a problem because uh, we disturbed the the the, the vascular venous uh, system in the posterior fossa, and it was embolized. And so at the end we finished the surgery, but that was the finding that we had, and. The and it looked here we have some fat and uh, and uh, and the, it was the pre op the post op the patient was was fine without uh, much of a problem more than that but we could see in this in the in the diffusion of the of the MRI we could see that this vascular the venous supply was disturbed and this would give us a. Uh, 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 or a stroke in there. And so this is not a good result because we learned that, uh, that also the materials which were used for the embolization could give us problems even though the surgery uh, did not uh, had any problems at all. And so it's very, it's very important to understand that. Then we decided that we had to, to visit some of our friends in order to understand better the pathology, in order to understand some surgical techniques, in order to try to improve and to do and to learn from other other friends uh, of how uh, they are they are uh, doing it, and uh, and so it's very important to to try to improve. And so, for example, after I visited uh, Dr. Borba, uh, we had this case. And so it's it's she has a, it's a patient that she uh, started with uh, bleeding through her ear, and uh, and uh, so it's very important uh, to close the external auditory canal to identify correctly the the, the facial nerve and try to uh, dissect it, even though sometimes uh, these tumors. Uh, are completely invading the, the region. Here we can see the, here we can see, this is the view that we always want to, to have, which is the jugular vein, the jugular ball, all the, the petrosal region, uh, which is, was full of, 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 of tumor and the, the sigmoid signs. This is the, 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 there's always some bleeding from the inferior petrosal sinus, which can be, Fact, uh, but this is the view that we always want to have after the surgery, and so this is the medial wall of the of the of the jugular valve, which is protecting the the cranial nerves, and this is all uh, empty of 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 tumor. Well, it was full of tumor prior to this, and so we here we can see that we here we have the the carotid, and we have a completely postoperative result here, and. It's very important for me. This was another learning because even though this was a little thick in the in the dura, but the thing is that in the follow up, this was starting to grow again. So even though this was a, a, a good resection, but this part was starting to grow, and so we had to send it again for radiation. And so uh, this is another another case uh, with this right posterior. Uh, for a jugular tumor, where uh, we find it that it's very important to dissect the the facial nerve completely and to remove uh, all the way to the last uh, fragment uh, of the last piece of of tumor and dissect it carefully from the uh, from the facial nerve in order to do a transposition of the facial nerve 
in order to have a wider exposure and to complete the, the removal of the tumor. As you can see here, that part of the tumor would not be, uh, could not be correctly removed if we wouldn't, uh, if we wouldn't dissect the part of, of, of we wouldn't dissect and, and uh, uh, transpose the, the facial nerve. And so at this moment, we have a, a, a more secure uh, removal. And as you can see, again, opening the jugular vein uh, and removing the tumor all the way to the, to the, to the, um, to the, param to the jugular bulb. It's important in order to complete the removal as we can see here. And here we have this, the jugular vein, the jugular bulb, and, uh, and as you can see here, we have the region of the tumor, and then we can pack it, and we are working anterior and posterior to the facial canal. So this is very important in these tumors to have a, a, good, to have a good exposure in order to, to reconstruct it well. Oh, I'm sorry for this. And so in this way, we would say that we are trying to, to get better with each case and to improve and to have it just like we were mentioning previously, like, a, like an art, like, a, like, a, like an art in, 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 the, in the temporal bone and in, in a surgical procedure. And so it's very important to always give your best. Always try to give your best, analyze your cases, learn from your friends and from, from, from your teachers and mentors. It's very important to always give your best and try to improve. Always have a good strategy for your surgery. You can never uh, just get uh, comfortable and say, oh, it's another case. No, each case you have to analyze it prior to what you're gonna do and always try to give your best effort. It's very, very important. And very, very important to have that strategy. You have to know anatomy, anatomy, and anatomy. It's very important to understand it. Uh, when we were doing this, uh, for us, it's very important to go to our lab and uh, to get a lab done and, and go to the lab and, and try to do and replicate the, 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 the skull-based approach in order to try to improve all the time, keep on improving with, with the dissections. And so what we did is we did, we went back to our lab and replicated the same, the same, the same approach with the same incision, understanding how the flap we could do it better than the prior, than we were doing prior uh, earlier. And so, very important, as I mentioned, to preserve always the gre greater auricular nerve, and which is very important in order for the reconstruction. And later on, also dissect correctly the the neurovascular structures as you can see here, and always uh, do a mastoidectomy, which is going to be tailored to each case, not all the cases. In some cases, you have to close the external auditory canal. In some cases, you don't. And so that is going to depend on which, uh, on how the clinical uh, status of the patient and how the tumor is inv invading the, the facial canal do uh, correctly and understand how to work on the temporal bone by yourselves, uh, not relying necessarily on an on a ENT or a, uh, on an autologist. So you have to do it yourself and understand the anatomy. And also here uh, showing the sigmoid sinus and, uh, and how to communicate the sigmoid sinus to the jugular bulb, which is very important to preserve the semicircular canals and the facial canal in order to later on open and dissect all the facial nerves to the going to the parotid, which is very important. Here we already opened the external auditory canal, which has to be properly uh, reconstructed and very important to understand this region, which is the region of C1 and the relationship that we're going to have, because many of these tumors have feeders that come from the vertebral artery. So it's very important to, to analyze this, uh, uh, this region in order to remove this lateral mass of C1. And sometimes you do have to do a, a transposition of the vertebral artery. And, and for example, in this case, here we are completing and we are dissecting anterior and we have 
to see the, the steloid process. And as we can see here, we can see the, the carotid uh, in the petrous region. And so this, this uh, what I mean is that all these dissections that we do in their lab with the learning uh, from mentors and all, and also uh, analyzing correctly our cases will give us all the tools that we need in order to improve. In the, and here we can see that we opened and, and we, the, the vertebral artery uh, ring, so we can, we can do a transposition in case it's needed. And so this at the end is part of our temporal bone uh, skull-based course that we do every year. And so it's very important that we understand and that we learn and that we and that we learn together with all these guys that we that come to our courses. And this is the way that we try to 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 improve with each case. So it's very important. This is part of our friends and uh, and uh, that we do the courses together and, and we have a, a very good time and a good learning. So this is my experience on the management of, of glomus jugularis tumors which keeps evolving as you can see in each case. It's, it's, it's very important because uh, even though you are a, a neurosurgeon with some experience, you always have to keep on learning and to keep on improving in order to, to keep doing better each case. Thank you very much for the opportunity to Dr. Ather uh, uh, to, to talk in this, in, this, uh, in this space. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mendes, for an excellent, excellent talk. Was Dr. It, Ather, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't excellent, it was awesome. Uh, you know. Thank you. Yes. Dr. Thank you, Ather, Dr. Ather, would you like to add something, please, if you have any comments? Who, me? Yes, sir. I'm, I'm speechless, man. So, yeah. so we have we have we have doctor yes sir sorry you were saying something no 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 we have we have some very good guests uh, international yeah. guests yeah. yes we have and dr duarte candido joining us from brazil and he has worked with dr borba that dr mendes mentioned in his talk also i would like to hear some comments you know some views from dr duarte as well uh, can you introduce dr duarte where he yes and dr Dr. Duarte, can you introduce yourself? Because you know, when I uh, met, you were just a fellow. Now you are like an emerging superstar, you know, in Brazil, and, you know. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, first, before introducing myself, congratulations, Professor Diego. Uh, excellent case, you see, highly difficult ones. Uh, I'm Duarte Khan from Brazil. I, I was a former fellow from Professor Borba. Uh, and I, I was a former fellow from Professor Lotto and Professor Christ. So I have really interest in school base and neurovascular surgery. And I think this comes together as, as you saw uh, Professor Diego's cases, you see that you need to be a, a school base surgeon, but actually you need a highly expertise to deal with uh, vascular surgery. Is that this kind of tumors, I think is the most difficult ones that we have uh, you need complex approaches. You need to deal with uh, all the vessels inside and outside the brain. You need to understand the cervical anatomy. You need to understand the skull base anatomy. All, all the way to do this kind of surgery. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Professor Diego Mendes said, uh, said uh, uh, a nice word when, when you see that you need to go and see people that used to do this kind of search this is because this is like rare, rare lesions, okay? Not uh, many people in the world has a, a great experience. You see now Dr. Diego has 30 cases, it's too much. It's not few cases, it's too much because these are hair lesions. Uh, and he saw, he uh, showed us the big ones. Actually they have small ones that we consider surgery to it too. Um, to do this kind of surgery, you need to deal with the skull base approach together with the cervical approach because this tumor is highly vascularized. It's difficult to treat it endovascularly. Actually, that is the main treatment is surgical. And in some cases you can use the, the endovascular to help you before the surgery. But sometimes you need to, to choose which kind 
of uh, embolization uh, uh, material use. Né? Uh, that case that he showed us about um, onyx, there are few uh, few cases in the literature that show that this is not good. You need uh, small particles to do this kind of embolization. And not every, every glomus is treated endovascular because when you do this embolization, the tumor became uh, thick. It's more difficult to remove it. Sometimes it, it becomes adhered to the, 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 um, the brainstem. But learning, it's the way to do this kind of surgery. You, you have to go to the laboratory, you have to train, you have to, to train again, you have to visit another friends in another part of the world. You need to, to see when one is going to operate, you go there to see, because yeah. before you try to do, you have to see a lot. Uh, this I learned from Professor Borba. First, see who does it better than you. Then you try to copy it. And maybe sometime you can do it. So keep in mind that learning is, is a process to do the best thing to the patient. Every case is different. Some case you have the whole horizontal part of the petrous carotid involved. Sometimes the, the tumor is just in the posterior fossa. But the way to reach them, it's sometimes the same because you need to do a a good decompress before you reach the tumor at the mastoid. You have to open all of it. You have to expose all the vein, all the vessels outside because you need to deal with the vascularization of the tumor. And most of the time, this vascularization is coming from the external carotid. And before you try to, to deal with the tumor, if you don't deal with the vessels outside, the tumor will bleed and it will be catastrophic for the patient. And Professor Diego showed us, I think, bigger ones. I never operated one such big as Professor Diego did. And the quality as he did. You see the patient can be saved from these tumors. This is benign, but in fact, it's not benign for the patient. You need to learn how to remove it. And if you remove it, keep the patient free from this disease. It's important to offer the best treatment for these patients. Sometimes the patient don't die because of the tumor. I had some patient that the tumor was so big that he almost died because of hydrocephalus. He came uh, with a depression because of the hydrocephalus. And to deal with the hydrocephalus, you need to deal with the tumor. I have to remove this tumor from the skull base. So uh, once again, thank you all. Thank you. Hassan, thank you, Professor Diego, and congratulations. Thank you, thank you, Duarte. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will be asking you, you know, in future also to join us for these sessions. Dr. Ather, so I can go uh, through some comments that I'm getting uh, in the chat box. So it's like everybody, like Dr. Ather said. So. Okay, so all of them who need, you know, the certificate, please fill the evaluation form. The link has been shared in the chat box. Dr. Aruba says it is an amazing and outstanding session ever. Dr. Mudassar Abbas says, concepts clear, thank you. Dr. Pinin Beg says, very nice and outstanding talk. Dr. Kaina Siddiqui says it was an amazing session, Dr. Mendes. As uh, Abdul says, very informative session. Thank you so much, sir. Shamil Zahir says, it's nice to see you all. And Dr. Rafia says, it's such skill surgery are done, then very limited and easy work for us as radiation oncologists to cover gross total volume. So, sir, I think maybe we are not doing, all of us, we are not doing such great work. So radiation oncologists is saying, and they are, <laughs> Praising your sections, Dr. Mendes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's very informative session. Rahim Khan says, again, uh, many thanks, sir. So I, and my friend from Taiwan, I, I don't know why he's not, you know, his camera is not on. Xiao Ching Chen, Duarte's friend as well. 
is joining us from Taiwan says, thank you. Dr. Chen, if you want, you can introduce yourself. And Kurata Len says, outstanding session, fantastic talk. So it's like, you know, it's amazing, you know, so. So Dr. Atzer, you would you like to ask something or you would like to share your experience with Dr. Mendes? Because what I see is just, you know, everybody's praising and everybody's amazed with Dr. Mendes' work. So yeah, maybe but, so my, my, my dad will join the bandwagon and get some praise myself, right? <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> share, share some praise. So, so um, you know, what are your thoughts about uh, working with ENT skull-based surgeons? Because whenever I do it and I, my experience of these skull bases is not as much as yours. Um, but uh, whenever I've done these, I've done them with ENT skull base. And you know, while while I'm exposing this part, I want them to uh, you know trace the um, uh, facial nerve and go back from there to the jugular foramen. What are your thoughts about that? Yes, I completely agree on on that. Uh, I think it's very ourselves. We don't have like a, an uh, ENT department that is interested in these cases. So in a way it's good and in a way it's bad, you know? Uh, that This has made us to, to, that we have to learn and we have to go to the lab and do it ourselves. Uh, they don't like, uh, they like uh, small surgeries and nasal endoscopy and stuff, you know, but they don't uh, like the, the, the in, in our institution. Um, the, they don't like the, the, the temporal bone as much as on and, and these pathologies. And so whenever I have worked with, with ENT uh, or the otologist on this, I find it very important that we also have to, to know how to do it in order to take the most advantage that we can. Whenever we have had in, the, in some few cases with an otologist, and so we have to know the detail, anatomic details in order to, to extend the most that we can uh, on each case. And so at the end, we like to do it by ourselves, by our skull-based team. And, uh, and that's how we have been working and, and trying to, to, to improve each case, you know? That's, I, that's I, been I, the... I, I, I can't agree more, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. Uh, if you really want to be a good skull-based surgeon, <laughs> You don't need to have any. It's just that oh, there was a time uh, for a decade we had an excellent ENT surgeon working with us. And it was so easy to work with him. Uh, but uh, to be a skull based surgeon, uh, you need to be comfortable with, and that and that applies to all other areas also. For example, there are people who uh, use cardiothoracic surgeons to get to have an access to the anterior mid thoracic spine. You know, if you really want to be a good, uh, you know thoracic spine surgeon, then you need to do that exposure yourself. So the, the other thing is, uh, I think Dr. Altaf had a question. The other thing is that, you know, uh, what, what, I, what I feel in Pakistan <clears throat> is that we are sort of hamstrung about the, uh, these uh, caravaric dissections. And, uh, you know, Essen has uh, taken a lead in setting up brain tumor lab over here. But then the kind of Sections that that you know we used to have uh, or I was exposed to in uh, let's say in uh, 94 hospital and other places uh, we have not been able to do those over here and that is a very important uh, aspect of all the skull based training uh, and and you are not the only one who's saying that there are quite a few top notch uh, skull based surgeons like you who have come on this uh, forum and and mentioned the same thing. So, so we need to we need to set it up. I mean, Asan, I'm just throwing it at you. We need to somehow set it up it, because getting the caravaric uh, uh, head well prepared is not an easy task. Pretty expensive coming over here, and if you don't have a well prepared caravaric head, then that dissection also becomes uh, sort of meaningless. Uh, if it's just a mm -hmm. simple unprepared caravaric head which was not preserved well, so these are these are the things that we need to do. And are there any other alternatives? Uh, by the way, uh, to the cadaveric head uh, that you would suggest uh, would help in this thing? Yes, I've seen that uh, there are new things in technology and uh, books, technology, simulation systems, uh, that, but I, I think that the, at the end, the best thing that we can do is, is, is the, the cadaveric head. It's the most realistic, it's the most, uh, the, the best, uh, way in order to, 
to use, for example, the drill properly and the, the quality of the bone and the drilling. So it's very important. I think that no technology is going to get better than the, than the, the more realistic than the cadaveric head. I understand perfectly that uh, in many places, uh, there are some legal, economic, and different types of, of limitations, uh, which don't uh, which don't uh, uh, allow, in a way, or make it complicated to have to have a cadaveric lab. Now we have a, a cadaveric lab here in, in Mexico City. Everyone is welcome to to come, and uh, and we are doing all these dissections and trying to improve the dissections and with the fellows uh, having some different projects in order to, to have a combination of the clinical and anatomical uh, experience, you know, so in a way for to improve the, the education. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so I think Dr. Altaf wanted to ask a question, we can ask him. And a couple of more comments. Dr. Sarmat saying excellent talk in organization. Dr. Nan also informative. Dr. Altaf, please. Yes, Hassan, thank you very much. Dr. Mendes, excellent talk and uh, really fascinating work you have been doing. So I had a couple of hey, questions. Dr. Altaf, Dr. introduce yourself also to Professor. Yes. Ed. So Dr. Mendes, I am I'm a neurosurgeon and I had the honor of working with Professor Atharinam as a no, I did not I did not I did not mean that part. I just meant you know your neurosurgeon <laughs> and your oncology. Okay. All right, go ahead. Okay. So I, I I have the honor of being the first neuro-oncology fellow in the country. And uh, I also had a chance to work in a couple of labs in the skull base, especially at St. Louis University Hospital. And after that exposure, I completely support your uh, standpoint that having a skull-based lab with the proper cadaver is very much essential for performing these kind of surgeries and for teaching purposes. Uh, and for, for your presentation, I was really fascinated. And the work you are doing is rare. And these rare things are made for the rarest people like you. Believe in me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the question, uh, I was just wondering how your clinical judgment is affected by the, the clinical presentation of patient. For example, in books, we have seen lots of, uh, lots of syndromes associated with jugular form and like the fecal name, Jackson syndrome, Villar syndrome that involves the cranial nerve 9, 10th, 11th and 12th. Uh, and so so how your clinical judgment for operating on these patients is affected by these, these cranial nerves when they are affected? So this is the part A question. And the part B is, since in my career, whenever I have seen these patients operated, they develop significant morbidity, especially paralysis of focal cord, leading to tracheostomy dependence. And and the CSF leak, as you mentioned your uh, your presentation as well, that you were facing the most commonly the CSF. Leaks. So how how to deal with this? And the question part C is when you decide to go for stereotactic radio surgery in these cases. I'm sorry, it's a long question. No, no, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Elte. Uh, very nice to meet you. Uh, yes, it's very important to have a, a proper clinical judgment on 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 every case, on all type of of cases. Uh, specifically talking about the uh, jugular foramen uh, paragliomas, it's it's very important. These glomus jugularis tumors. These are tumors that are uh, usually uh, with a quite a, a small and continuous uh, growing. And so many of our patients come, all, all, they come with, uh, with uh, lower cranial nerves uh, deficit and uh, it all depends. If the patient has prior to the surgery, uh, uh, a lower cranial nerve deficit, which requires a tracheostomy or a gastrostomy, it is, it is used. But most of the time they are, we do a laryngoscopy uh, to all locations in the diagnostic, diagnostic protocol to see how it compensates the vocal cords compensate properly. And uh, 
most of the times uh, they can be partially involved. And if they compensate, we don't use a, a, a tube, a, a trickle tube. And, uh, and uh, to tell you the truth in the post-operative, since we always try to improve, we always try to preserve the medial wall of the jugular bulb. So that means that you are not touching at all the, the, the lower cranial nerves. And so it is very, uh, very, that part is very important because if you open the directly the, the jugular, some tumors open and those are the tumors that give the symptoms. But if you preserve that medial wall, that is the, the most important tip in order to avoid post-operative uh, uh, lower cranial nerve uh, deficit. And so for us, it, to tell you the truth, it has not been uh, an issue. It's more the facial nerve at the end, which is uh, something that we have to, that we want to, to, to work or, or to preserve uh, properly. It's not the, the, the lower cranial nerves. And in those patients, what we do is that in case that we have a regrowth, we do send them to, to ready surgery on, only when these are small, or, or persistent tumors that, uh, how do you call it, uh, that grow again. And so in those cases, we, we send them to, to, to radio surgery. And those are the, 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 the CSF leak. It's mostly inside incision. And so it's very important to try to improve with a, a, with a good flap. And we have been kind of improving our flap in order to to do a better reconstruction. Those are the, the way to, to, to improve those, those complications. Okay, perfect, thank you. Dr. Mendes, I want to use this opportunity to ask, how often do you have this skull-based course in Mexico City? And will, are you going to be in Rio also next year for the skull-based you know, meeting? If I'm um, in Rio, yes, 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 we're going to be there. And uh, we're doing these courses. Uh, we have different courses. We call it a 360 degree uh, uh, course, which is including three different courses one for the cavernous sinus, two for the temporal bone, and three for the, for the extended endonasal. Uh, endoscopic approaches. So in this way, we do a 360 degree view of all the skull-based pathology. And we do them uh, once a year, each course, and then we have some other combined. So uh, you can contact me directly and we have uh, every two, three months, we're doing uh, one type of course. Okay, that's great. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, okay. So I want to ask if uh, Dr. Chen can unmute himself and introduce, and if he has some experience of jugular form and tumor. I'm here, Chinga. Hi, I'm Shao Ching Chen from Taipei, Taiwan. Uh, I was curious, uh, thank you to Professor Diego and Ether, Ashan Duarte, and all the audience, this is fantastic speech. And I was wondering, because I was working in the biggest hospital in Taiwan, we have about 20 million population. But in the past year, I, I've only seen like uh, less than 10 small glomus jugularis. We have a lot of different cases, but in this kind of case, we don't have many. I am not experienced in this tumor, so I really learned a lot and I, I'm speechless to the... Uh, fantastic speech. I'd like to know, uh, Professor Diego, you mentioned a case after uh, onyx embolization that the tumor became difficult to remove, engorge the new cranial nerve deficit. And Professor Durate also mentioned uh, the onyx makes it more difficult to remove the tumor, not easier to do it. But what if we, we only embolize the feeder instead of the whole tumor, what if we just embolize the feeder? Will it be helpful or not? Thank you, Dr. Cheng, for the, for the question. Um, yes, these are rare tumors, as, as Duarte mentioned pre previously, these are rare tumors where, which uh, they focus mainly on, 
on on referral centers. Uh, as you mentioned, that working in a big uh, center, it's always important to to um, uh, to have uh, some. It all depends. For me, with that first case, I, I started learning about this pathology, and all of a sudden, more cases and more cases were coming through the years. Uh, and so, it's it, as we mentioned previously, it's a part of, of, of a learning process and getting experience on these cases. Uh, yes, I think it's very important to to work on the feeders. That's that's one of the cases that I that I mentioned. Uh, the mo one of the worst learnings I had is never close completely the, the external carotid, you know, it's it's only work on the feeders and analyze it, even though if it's a gigantic tumor, always analyze which is the feeder that it's that it's uh, that it's giving you the the the, the arterial supply and uh, and uh, for me that that experience with the onyx was not was not good at all because the onyx in a way like kind of, of, of uh, finds its way up into the tumor. So it's, it's, I, I found it not, uh, not, uh, not a good experience with that uh, material. And we've been working with, with particles also as, as Duarte mentioned. May, may I talk to? Uh, uh, Xiao, uh, we do not use yes. uh, onyx anymore for embolism, embolization of these tumors, use small particles for embolization is better because of this kind of complication. And most of the tumors you do not need to embolize. We know that's a big tumor, highly vascularized, but you can deal it with surgery, inside the surgery. We, we embolization, the embolization is on the feeders, the external carotid feeders, not from the internal carotid, not from the basilar, mm. not from the vertebral just from the external carotid. Actually, most of the tumor comes from the ascending pharyngeal nerve, uh, ascending pharyngeal artery or from the occipital branches, and sometimes from meningeal branch and from the vertebral artery. Uh, most, of the, most of, I think every surgery, I remove the, the vertebral artery from its canal, uh, from C1, and when you do it, you have to coagulate these, these small branches that uh, irrigates the tumor too, these meningeal branches from the, the, the vertebral art become really big when, when they are, uh, appear there, okay? Some branches come from the tympanic branches, uh, from the petrous carotid. These branches you will deal at the end of the tumor when the tumor is reaching the petrous carotid. And this cannot be embolized, never. It's impossible. And branches from, sometimes the, these big, huge tumors, they have pio branches, have branches from pica. You, you cannot embolize this, never. Okay, when you embolize, the tumor becomes re really hard to deal. And these tumors are, some, most of the time, they are soft, but vascularized. When you start devascularizing from the initial, from the beginning of the surgery, they become uh, mostly a vascular and it's easier to remove, except these internal branches from the carotid. It's the, the hardest part to do, it's the end of the part. It's become, a, because these branches come in front, just under the bulbo, bulbo jugulare, okay? The domo jugulare, just under the tympanic uh, bone. And, one other part that becomes very uh, bloody is when you remove it inside from the vein and you have the inferior petrosal, uh, inferior petrosal venous sinus. system, sinus, excuse me, the inferior petrosal, that becomes to, to bleed again because you open it. Then you have to patch it with some glue, most of the time tissue glue, fibrin glue, okay? But in my, in my practice, I learned it with Professor Barber. When we use uh, embolization, is for tumors that already have complete uh, deficits from the nerves. If they don't have uh, complete uh, facial nerve palsy, I don't use it because you can cause it. Okay. Thanks. Thanks to Professor Diego. Thanks to Ate and for sharing this key point.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chen. But I don't know why you called Duarte as Professor Duarte. I <laughs> okay. All right. So I think it's time. I'm not Professor. Just a friend. I, I, know, I know that. Yeah, Duarte. you are in my heart. Yes. <laughs> well, this is what you should do, Chen. Call <laughs> Hassan, Professor Hassan, and then he will not complain. <laughs> okay, sir. So uh, it's, it's time for us, you know, it's like uh, to close the webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Mendes. Thank you. So we are really honored to have you with us today. And it was such a great session. Thank you, Duarte, to you know, accepting our invitation and joining us as a panelist. And so, Dr. So would you like to add some final remarks and then we can end the session? Uh, the final remarks are with you. Uh, but, you know, we should look forward to, well, I think I do have a final remark. So I think what we should we should do is think about developing, you know, with people like you, uh, Dr. Mendez and some other skull based surgeons, a 3D model. So once we have, uh, we have a software, then we can re reprint it in different places across the world. And I think we should be able to do it. So people like you should know what are the key things in that one, and we can work together. To make those three because uh, as in did that three uh, 3d um, stuff uh, for the skull base and yes. some of those are very nice very detailed so i think we can do that uh that that 3d model i mean that will not be as good as your uh, main uh, lab but then still uh, you know we will get maybe 60 70 percent of what we learn over there so we should yeah, any any kind of of new things in order to improve the learning I think yeah. it's going to be a great help for for future generations. And what I found uh, most importantly at the end is that that teaching is the best learning in a way because in all the courses for uh, with all the participants, they think that we know everything and that they are learning. They're all the only ones learning, but no, it's not like that. We are all learning from all the, the different uh, dissections and all the different activities that we do. So any kind of, of improvement in the software or technology or everything is great for, for everybody. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you also. I think I'm in a green room. If I don't move, it's environmental friendly, lights get off and it's telling me we should stop now. <laughs> thank you so much, thank you all. <laughs> and have a great weekend and hope to see you all in two weeks. Thank you, Dr. Mendes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the invitation. See you, Hassan. Thank and you, Dr. Arthur. Thank you. Ciao. Adios, Duarte. Ciao. Valeu, Ciao, Professor. Bye. Valeu, Duarte. Muito obrigado, amigão. Okay, so we talk later on the phone. Thank you. Thank you.